Welcome to the Kotke Ride Home for Tuesday, February 9th, 2021. I'm Jackson Bird. The science behind the benefits of going for walks regularly and some tips for incorporating more walks into your life. The town in Florida whose water was almost poisoned when a nefarious individual hacked into their water supply. The researchers hoping to recycle face masks as roads and a pandemic-themed spec script roundup. Here are some of the cool things from the news today. Walking has had a big year, with more people staying at home more and many fitness facilities closed. A lot of people turned to walking as a way to get a change of environment or a bit of activity in their days. But if you have fallen off of your walking habit or never got on one or just want to feel validated in your life choices, here are a few points in favor of going for a walk. Quoting the Harvard Business Review, According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, a single bout of moderate to vigorous activity, including walking, can improve our sleep, thinking, and learning while reducing symptoms of anxiety. End quote. And it's also one of the safest activities you can indulge in during the pandemic. Fresh air is great for staying healthy, and as we all know, the outdoors are safer than indoors as far as transmission goes. So can't hang out indoors with a nearby friend or family member? Go for a walk together. Just, you know, wear masks and skip the hugs. And this is more specific to areas where you're able to walk to business locations, but you could also consider walking with a friend to run errands, killing three birds with one stone. And Helen Peterson wrote a great pn to The Errand Friend last month that I can't stop thinking about. It's that one friend that you always just casually run errands with. Quoting Peterson, Errand friendship requires time, but no planning. You just join someone on their life trajectory for a while. You might get something done along the way, but the focus isn't your own productivity. You can do errands with a boyfriend or girlfriend or partner, but it's just not the same. The qualities of errand friendship are different. They're softer, somehow, more comfy. And because errand friendship is rarely planned, it never feels like an obligation or something you dream of canceling to free up time just to exhale, because the best errand friendship feels as restorative as time alone. End quote. Maybe the pandemic has caused you to have an errand friend for the first time because there's nothing else you can really do together. Or maybe you've lost your errand friend because you live in a more car-dependent place. Even if an errand friend isn't in the cards for you right now, maybe think about who in your life might be able to become your walking friend. Someone whose companionship will leave you feeling restored and uplifted just like the walk itself should. And short of a friend, walks are also a great time to catch up on podcasts or audiobooks or new music. And while walking may not feel like big exertion for some, it's still super good for your body and can even help for chronic pain, especially some of the back and muscle aches you may feel from sitting at your desk all day. I'm always pleasantly surprised how much better my entire body feels after a walk or when I've been walking regularly for a period of time. One of my favorite benefits of walking, though, is its seemingly magical ability to help me clear my head, think through problems, and come up with ideas. Henry David Thoreau wrote, Methinks that the moment my legs begin to move, my thoughts begin to flow. End quote. And you don't just have to trust the words of a dubious essayist. Countless studies have been conducted on this topic. Quoting The New Yorker, What is it about walking in particular that makes it so amenable to thinking and writing? The answer begins with changes to our chemistry. When we go for a walk, the heart pumps faster, circulating more blood and oxygen not just to the muscles but to all the organs, including the brain. Many experiments have shown that after or during exercise, even very mild exertion, people perform better on tests of memory and attention. Walking on a regular basis also promotes new connections between brain cells, staves off the usual withering of brain tissue that comes with age, increases the volume of the hippocampus, a brain region crucial for memory, and elevates levels of molecules that both stimulate the growth of new neurons and transmit messages between them. End quote. A series of studies at Stanford several years ago also found that walks were better than staying put for inspiring creativity and problem-solving. 
although admittedly they found walks were not as great for more focused thinking. The studies also found that walking through nature as opposed to a busy urban environment was better for your memory and for clearing or calming your head, though city streets might be better for sparking creative ideas. Business innovator Nilifer Merchant offered another application for walks in her 2013 TED Talk. She encourages people to start a new habit of ditching the conference room or the coffee shop and instead taking your meeting outside by going for a walk. A classic walk and talk. And this still works in our socially distant times. Maybe even better because you don't need to convince your colleague or potential business partner to join in on your unorthodox idea. You just need to request a phone call instead of a video call and take the call while you walk around your neighborhood. And even if going for a walk isn't in the cards for you due to your neighborhood or physical limitations or anything else, think about another way you can either be active or change up your environment, ideally with some fresh air. As Merchant said in her TED Talk, getting out of the box leads to out of the box thinking. Sometimes just getting away from our main computer station can make a big difference. So walking, I'm in favor of it. And as a bonus, I'm throwing a video in the show notes that I tweeted a while back about two guys who go for a walk every day at the same time and meet in the middle to high five. There's a lot more to their story, though. Be warned, it will make you feel things. So this is mildly horrifying. Someone hacked into a Florida town's water treatment plant's software and remotely tried to poison the town's water supply. Fortunately, an employee caught it as it was happening and was able to thwart the attempt, but it's still a pretty ominous situation. How did it happen? Well, the key, in my layperson opinion, and the thing that we should maybe be extra vigilant about in these remote working times, is that the Oldsmar, Florida water treatment plant uses software called TeamViewer so that employees can remotely share screens and troubleshoot issues, and the software also means that someone can take over your screen and cursor. So initially, when an employee noticed his cursor moving erratically, he thought that's what it was. But then it got stranger. Quoting Wired, The cursor began clicking through the water treatment plant's controls. Within seconds, the intruder was attempting to change the water supply's levels of sodium hydroxide, also known as lye or caustic soda, moving the setting from 100 parts per million to 11,100 parts per million. In low concentrations, the corrosive chemical regulates the pH level of potable water. At high levels, it severely damages any human tissue it touches. According to city officials, the operator quickly spotted the intrusion and returned the sodium hydroxide to normal levels. Even if he hadn't, the poisoned water would have taken 24 to 36 hours to reach the city's population, and automated pH testing safeguards would have triggered an alarm and caught the change before anyone was harmed, they say. End quote. The whole thing is still being confirmed and corroborated by officials. They don't have many details to share, and it sounds like they don't have many answers about who the culprit is and how they were able to infiltrate the TeamViewer software and know exactly what to do. This is the kind of situation Oldsmar and most towns are aware of as a potential and prepare for, but clearly their safeguards may not have been totally foolproof. Quoting again, Security professionals have long advised not only segregating IT and OT networks for maximal security, but also limiting or ideally eliminating all connections from operational technology systems to the internet. But Sheriff Bob Gultieri conceded that the plant's OT systems were externally accessible, and that all evidence points to the attacker accessing them from the internet. As unprecedented as Oldsmar's public announcement of a cyber-sabotage attempt on its water systems may be, the attack it describes is hardly unique, says Leslie Carhart, a principal threat analyst at industrial control system security firm Dragos. She says she's seen incidents firsthand in which even unsophisticated hackers access software applications that control physical equipment and start messing with them. Thousands of such systems are discoverable over the internet with search tools like Shodan, she points out. It's often only the complexity and safeguards in industrial control systems that prevent hacker meddling from having serious consequences. Do I think that on a regular basis people are logging into HMI systems and hitting buttons? Absolutely, says Carhartt. Do those things have a measurable impact on the real world? Very rarely. End quote. 
But sometimes it does work, like in 2015 when a group of Russian hackers managed to turn off the power for a quarter of a million Ukrainian civilians. Carhartt additionally points out that water treatment and sewage plants, while being among the most vulnerable to these types of hacks, tend to be the most chronically underfunded and understaffed, especially when it comes to IT professionals. Despite that, they keep doing what they can. Sheriff Gaultieri has been spreading the word and making sure all government agencies in the greater Tampa Bay area reassess their security protocols. Hopefully, the publicity of the attempt will spur all towns everywhere to follow suit. One of the many adverse effects of the pandemic on the environment has been the sheer amount of waste generated. More people are using more items like disinfectant wipes, you know, anything where you might have fudged the lines on perceived hygiene in the name of sustainability before, some people have now thrown in the towel on that and picked up a paper towel instead. You know, there are a laundry list of items that are good for sanitation or preventing virus transmission, but bad for the environment. And high up on that list, masks. Surgical masks, N95s, KN95s, any kind that's meant to be used only once or a handful of times if you're risking it. Estimates say there are 6.8 billion disposable masks being used around the world each day. So this is a big problem. Well, researchers at RMIT, a tech and design university in Melbourne, are experimenting with using disposable face masks to create roads. In a study published in the journal Science of the Total Environment, they looked first at the possibility of incorporating the masks into road-building materials and then into their engineering benefits. Quoting RMIT University, Roads are made of four layers, subgrade, base, subbase, and asphalt on top. All the layers must be both strong and flexible to withstand the pressures of heavy vehicles and prevent cracking. Processed building rubble, known as Recycled Concrete Aggregate, or RCA, can potentially be used on its own for these three base layers. But the researchers found adding shredded face masks to RCA enhances the material while simultaneously addressing environmental challenges on two fronts, PPE disposal and construction waste. Construction, renovation, and demolition account for about half the waste produced annually worldwide, and in Australia, about 3.15 million tons of RCA is added to stockpiles each year rather than being reused. The study identified an optimal mixture, 1% shredded face masks to 99% RCA. That delivers on strength while maintaining good cohesion between the two materials. The mixture performs well when tested for stress, acid, and water resistance, as well as strength, deformation, and dynamic properties, meeting all the relevant civil engineering specifications, end quote. The researchers say that using their recycled road material for just one kilometer of a two-lane road would use three million masks, and therefore save 93 million tons of waste from going to the landfill. Now, one thing they need to further research is how the process would change when they incorporate sterilizing used face masks, because so far the experiments were conducted using unused masks. Still, Professor Jia Li, who leads the RMIT School of Engineering research team, said, quote, If we can bring circular economy thinking to this massive waste problem, we can develop the smart and sustainable solutions we need, end quote. And until such a program comes to your local area, don't forget to snip the earbands of your masks before you throw them away to prevent sea critters from getting stuck in them. Despite the absolutely massive amount of media out there right now, it's understandable if, during this trying time, you've returned to some old favorites. Rewatching TV shows that feel like a home cooked meal or a reunion with friends from growing up who you actually liked. For me, at the start of the pandemic, it was Parks and Rec. Lately, it's been Gilmore Girls. Whether you've been doing a rewatch of your old favorites or not, you might enjoy envisioning how the pandemic would have played out if some of those shows were still on the air. Of course, some of them have delivered in official capacities, maybe too many of them, if I'm being honest. It seemed like every network was hopping on that Zoom reunion trend for a while there. And while some of those were fun, the Parks and Rec special admittedly made me teary-eyed, it's much more fun to imagine a typical episode set in our present environment. And sometimes fans are able to create something way more entertaining than the powers that be. 
Enter the great spec script glut of 2020 and 2021. Out-of-work screenwriters, comedians, and everyday folks have been penning spec scripts for pandemic-themed episodes of tons of hit shows, including Seinfeld, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, The West Wing, Gilmore Girls, and, most recently, The Office. I saw the Gilmore Girls one when comedy writer Mike Desenzo tweeted it last December, and it is honestly way better than the reunion series, which I suppose isn't saying much, but DeCenzo's version is absolutely my new headcanon. Now, I'm not going to read excerpts from any of these because I don't think there's anything more boring than being forced to listen to descriptions of a TV show that you don't watch and have no interest in watching, but I will link to an AV Club article that rounds up all of these and more so you can go read the ones that you actually want to. And if none of those tickle your fancy, might I recommend hitting up Archive of Our Own and reading some fan fiction? I know, it gets a bad stereotype rap, but there's plenty of well-written fan fiction out there that rivals some of these spec scripts, and it exists for just about every TV show, movie, or book you could imagine. So, if you want more from your TV comfort food shows, hopefully this will tide you over. Well, that is it for today. As always, this show was produced by Ride Home Media and Kotki.org. I'm Jackson Bird, and I am going to go take a walk while having Siri read me some office fan fiction. I hope you have a great rest of your day, and I will talk to you again tomorrow.